Hello, and welcome to another episode of the GPS Spotlight. My name is Jessica Walker. I am the digital host here at Great Black Speakers. And today's is with our Great Black Speaker, Elger Hawkins. Elger Hawkins is a community and anti-war activist born in Harlem, New York. He's a member of the Socialist Alternative, the CWI, and he has been there for 21 years. He toured internationally and invited to address audiences uh, such as South Africa to Ireland, from Brazil, all the way there back into the U.S. He addresses the Black struggle in the U.S. and he has been involved in recent Black Lives Matter movement and the fight for the $15 movement. He's contributed regularly to the Social Alternative newspaper and the socialistworld.net on race, criminal justice, and a historic Black freedom movement. Algier has lectured at Harvard University, Hunter College. He's also done some lectures here at Clark University, as well as the University of Toronto. So within this interview, we talk a lot about race relations, political views, and we'll get into a bit of what Trump's presidency means to the Black community. So go ahead and take a listen as we jump into our interview with Elger Hawkins. You can go ahead and book Elger at greatblackspeakers.com. <laughs> Hello, you all. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. Thank you so much for watching the Great Black Speaker series. So if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our channel here and go ahead and leave a comment. Today we have Elger Hawkins, who is going to be telling us a bit about the work that he has been doing and how he is a great Black speaker. So thank you so much for joining us here, Elger. Yeah, I'm oh, so, so excited to have My you pleasure. here. And I am looking forward to hearing some of your uh, political views here as well. Um, so you have been in this work. So go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. Uh, my name is LJ Hawkins. I'm, I was born and raised in Harlem, New York. Uh, I've been an organizer for 20 years mm -hmm. uh, on different campuses, uh, universities, uh, also in the workplace as well. I'm a former Teamster and a uh, healthcare worker with Local 1189 in New York City. Um, and I think this is a great opportunity uh, for working people in the poor to start to articulate what they need and what they want uh, finally, um, and I've been lucky enough to work with so many different people around the country on some of these key issues like healthcare, like uh, economic justice, uh, and also uh, speaking out against law enforcement terror in our communities. Wow, I love that. So, what does being a great black speaker mean to you? Um, well, first of all, I mean, there's a great, great, profound history of the black prophetic uh, and, and oratorical history. Um, we can go back to the great Frederick Douglass, uh, of course, Dr. King, Malcolm X, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker. Uh, there's a richness uh, to the prophetic voice of black folks uh, because we faced so much uh, terror in our lives uh, as a collective and also as individuals. And so to be able to speak to be able to organize, to be able to articulate uh, what we have felt for so many years is one of those great honors. And uh, if you if you think you're good, uh, and to be able to grace a stage and representing a great black speakers uh, as an as a bureau, as a place where people and organizations can find folks that will articulate uh, their demands, their thoughts, uh, and also their history. And, and our stories. Um, so it's a great, it's a great opportunity, great chance, and I, I've been very blessed uh, to have this opportunity uh, to be uh, a member. So you've kind of talked about racing the stage, and also some of the other, like you said, poetic voices that have um, come before us. For you, why did you choose your current profession? Why did you choose to go into this type of work and also use the stage as a place for you to kind of get your voice out there and be heard? You know, I've been organizing for a very long time and been part of an organization for over 20 years. And I decided that it was time to carry through my passion. Uh, I love communicating with people. I love reaching out to folks. I love using 
my victories and my defeats mm -hmm. as some sort of learn lesson for others. Uh, and I've been very lucky uh, that people have mm -hmm. sometimes come up to me and say, thank you for your words. Uh, thank you for your inspiring, um, connecting uh, with their whole entire spirit uh, in their lives. Mm -hmm. So uh, I love language. Uh, I love just the art of language uh, and words and what it can do Definitely. and what it can uh, and how it can move people mm -hmm. uh, to see, actually see their own value. And because uh, I know people have done it for me. Yeah, and I, yeah. I you're so right. Words are definitely well. powerful and they can empower uh, if you use them correctly. Um, so with that being said, yes. what are some of the hurdles that you've had to kind of overcome, you know, from where you where you were to where you are today? What are some of the hurdles? Um, you know, I've I've <laughs> I've been two times divorced. <laughs> I have an eight-year-old son. Um, I have the law. I lost my mother at a very young age. Uh, I was uh, eighteen. Wow. I was nineteen years old, mm -hmm. about to turn twenty, in nineteen ninety-four, and so I had to become head of household mm -hmm. when certainly I was still a child, in so many ways. And so those eight, those experiences have made me mm -hmm. a leader, sometimes a reluctant leader, when I didn't want to. Uh, but I knew I had to because I had a younger brother and I had a younger sister. And so we had to do it for each other. Uh, and so through those experiences, I think I could connect. And also I've been in the workplace. Uh, I've been in you know situations where I've had to speak up for myself, uh, speak up alongside my coworkers. Um, I've listened to their stories, their struggles of family and uh, drug addiction, alcohol, uh, prison sometimes. And so I think when I do speak, I bring all those experiences with me. And I think that's why in some ways I'm able to connect with them uh, and connect with what they've gone through in their lives. Um, mm -hmm. So I, in fact, in some ways it's made me stronger. Mm -hmm. Although at times I've been weak, to be honest with you. Um, but I think whatever that doesn't kill you, as they say, makes you stronger. And wow. in some ways I, I love I'm that. A yeah, and I, I think that's absolutely true, right? I think in order to become a survivor, become strong, you have to go through some things and some battles and, um, you know, through that valley, so to speak, <laughs> in order to reach the top, right? Definitely. Um, so that's right. what are some that's of right. your goals um, that absolutely. you have coming up? Absolutely. You know, what are some of the things that you, you know, are projects or activities that you're currently like really busy working on, you know, um, that you need to tackle and you want to uh, take on? Well, I mean, first and foremost is the urgency of the Trump presidency. Um, I am, I'm, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of organizing, uh, getting ready for some big protests yeah. during the inauguration on January 20th. There's going to be a mass demonstration of our sisters on January 21st mm -hmm. to reject his misogyny and sexism. Um, but this, this past week, uh, I've been in Boston, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. uh, speaking. Uh, at three campuses uh, in Northeastern, Emerson, uh, and UMass Boston, uh, and talking about uh, the development of Trump, uh, what are some of the issues, and how can we organize mm -hmm. to kind of fight back against his mm -hmm. agenda of misogyny, of sexism, yeah. of really of grotesque neoliberalism, actually. Uh, and when we look up, uh, we think about the black experience mm -hmm. of the most recent era, or the recent period, um, we've lost great amounts of wealth. Uh, our job opportunities are becoming slimmer and slimmer. Our education Definitely. is being eroded, particularly public education. And, you know, many of us are the children of Ferguson and Baltimore and Flint, of course, Flint, Michigan, and the contaminated water. And so those are some of the things, some of the projects. I was just writing an article basically about Donald Trump and how do we struggle against racism, systemic racism. And so um, that's what I've been doing currently. And probably for the next few months that's that's what i'll be busy doing yeah. uh really trying to organize some type wow. of sustained wow. fight and against Trump. so i know uh, along with that like you're just one person can't do this alone so what are some of the um ways that you are reaching out to that's others right. are you utilizing media to do this how are you reaching out to others to kind of rally and get everyone together to mm -hmm. work towards this agenda Yes, uh, definitely uh, having uh, not only the protests, 
we're really doing the, the old school grassroots organizing. When the cameras go away, going to the communities, going to people's workplace, going to the universities, uh, having type of discussions that will plan out demonstrations, yeah. plan out protests, doing teach-ins, uh, mm -hmm. writing flyers. These are things that old school organizing uh, particularly if I think of uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, and the work they used to do uh, in the Deep South uh, with sharecroppers uh, going door to door, literally, and talking to the people and trying to get mm -hmm. them uh, to be agents of change. Uh, we know that many people are scared. It's, it's a fearful moment, actually. Uh, the Trump presidency is a step backwards, particularly if you think about um, the presidency of Obama, um, which I do have my criticisms deep criticisms. Uh, but if you think about it, the symbolism of the first black president, uh, and now we have someone who uh, open openly uses racist and, and misogynist ideas. It's a step backwards uh, and culturally and, and even in our norms, mm -hmm. right? That we thought we had overcome, you know, many, many decades ago. But in some ways it seems like it's returning back in a very grotesque way. And so this is an opportunity I think for us to say, we have to organize. We cannot be now silent. And I think sometimes people were very silent uh, under the Obama years because it was so so symbolic, so powerful. But you know, his agenda was very much the same in the sense of Wall Street and bailouts to Wall Street and drone bombs and yeah. deportations of immigrants and all these things. So if we criticize Trump, then we have to also be critical of Obama and his policies because I think Trump has been emboldened by the atmosphere in US society. And I think young people, it was interesting that the last, uh, the evening after he won and became president elect Trump, um, there was mass demonstrations that took place. And what I saw with my own eyes, thousands of people, white, black, gay, straight, uh, it just didn't matter. Young babies actually with their, with their mothers and fathers marching, saying that we reject those ideas that we, we know that we can be a better America than, than what we're getting right now, that we're seeing right now. And I was really, really optimistic, actually. I was profoundly moved uh, by the by the folks that I saw on the on those streets. And I hope to yeah, transform that to daily definitely. organizing. You know, and I I I feel the same way. I feel the same way. And in a lot of respects, you know, I think that there was an, a decision, but there wasn't a decision, you know, <laughs> there was a decision, but it wasn't accepted as a decision. Right. And I think right. that right. the work that you're doing is very important. Um, so right. yeah, no, definitely. It's what happened after that time. And then, like you said, just the rise right. of racism and the rise of emotion, you know, if we were to look at all of the, um, I know you are grassroots, but looking at just the media portion of it and what happened via and people just spilling out literally right. their emotions on how they just felt like, oh my gosh, like you said, going backwards and not forwards. Um, I think what you're doing is definitely needed and necessary. I That's mean, right. the, the amount of trauma that was induced just because of that decision <laughs> in itself, you know, so definitely, yes. Uh, yes. I think it must yes. be needed. Um, so moving forward and looking at um, your platform and, you know, your speaking abilities, uh, can you give us some advice um, that you would give to people who would wish to follow in your own footsteps? Um, either your speaking abilities on the platform or off, because you're not only speaking on actual stages, on digital stages as well, but you're also going into the community and you're rallying, you're bringing togetherness in that, with inside of that community as well. So if someone wanted to follow in your footsteps and become a leader, um, as you say yourself, <laughs> um, how would they do that? What would, what would some advice be from you on how to do that? I mean, I think first and foremost, um, mm -hmm. the question of having fear. Um, we know mm -hmm. that sometimes people have been very fearful to speak mm -hmm because of the repercussions, the consequences of doing that. Um, there's been many. I mean, the first person I think of, Paul Robeson, who was mm -hmm. the biggest superstar of the 20th century. And basically because he was speaking out against racism and white supremacy, mm -hmm. that basically he had his passport revolt for about eight years. Mm -hmm. and he couldn't travel the world to perform. Um, he's one of the great artists that we've ever produced in the society. So we know that people yeah. who speak out 
you know, or vilified. Um, so in some ways, I, I have no fear, actually. Uh, I definitely believe what Dr. King said is true, uh, that a man, you know, who, to paraphrase, actually, uh, a man that's not uh, willing to die for something or to stand up for something, you know, is not living a full life. Um, and so the first thing I would say mm -hmm. to people is that we must conquer our fear uh, and the consequences of that. Um, that we must stand for, if we believe the injustice, then we must stand for that mm -hmm. idea and that concept. Mm -hmm. And on the speaking side, it's not so much the style and the approach, but the question is, yeah. um, master your material. Mm -hmm. Know your material left and right, up, up and down. Know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Even if you over-prepare yourself, have so much information in your back pocket that you should be a master of that material. Um, that's why I hate people that use computers <laughs> to speak yeah. from or laptops or mm -hmm. phones. I, I'm of the old school. Mm -hmm. I like the pen and I like the pad. Uh, I like the, mm -hmm. the literally write out what I'm going to say. Um, and if I, I'm able to master my material, mm -hmm. I can improvise. So mm -hmm. I can literally jump off topic mm -hmm connect to something else and yeah. come back to it. Also practice, practice, mm -hmm. practice, practice. It's like being a musician. The great musicians are always practicing. Uh, the great athletes, mm -hmm. you know, there's a story of Larry Bird, the basketball player, who used to come to the gym two hours before a game and leave two hours mm -hmm. after the game, taking shots. And so, and that's what made him one of the great basketball players of all time. So the practice, the preparation, uh, making links mm -hmm. to contemporary issues alongside historical issues. That's what I think uh, moves people and also personalize it a little bit too as well. I think that's how people become connected with you when you tell your story a little bit. Mm -hmm. And they can say, wow, I've had that same experience. Uh, I did a speaking engagement one time mm -hmm. at the school, School of Visual Arts, and a young lady had a very traumatic moment on the train and she brought her feelings and her emotions mm -hmm. at the meeting and she started to cry. Yeah. And it, it, since I was the main speaker, it, it put me in a place where I had to say something, I had to address that. And it felt good because it allowed me at least to connect with her and talk about her trauma. And I said to her to take that trauma and put it into your art. So then you can have a therapeutic moment to kind of get that trauma out of your system and put it into what is what you find to be beautiful and that is creating art of painting or writing or writing music and so those are the things that i think what i've learned over the years is the best approach or an approach to to really uh, become someone who uh, can be a leader uh, can exhibit leadership qualities and sometimes those things people have it naturally sometimes people don't but i think the first things when when the, when their soul has been touched by something and they want to act upon it, then they're making us, they're, they're walking down the road of being a leader for themselves and their wider wow. community. I love that. Um, so I think what you're saying is don't get so high up on the stage that you lose your humanness and your connectability, right? Um, you, you have to make sure that you're able to connect Absolutely. and have that connection Absolutely. and keep yourself as a human, not some floating <laughs> untouchable <laughs> being. <laughs> yes. You know, yes. That can sometimes Absolutely. happen when you get up on the stage. Absolutely. Um, so what are you doing? You, uh, you've already kind of told me. That was a great segue, by the way, into one of your most memorable speaking experiences, but I'm not sure if that would be your memor most memorable. So tell me what your most memorable speaking experience is. Uh, I've, had, I've had a few. Um, I think the biggest is probably the most recent Trump rally, anti-Trump mm -hmm. rally after the uh, victory, because um, I looked out, was mm -hmm. proud. We had 10,000 people out there and I was awestruck at first because uh, I don't I, actually I don't get fearful on the stage, but I get uh, mm -hmm. I get the sense yeah. of high <laughs> from it, a, a bit of adrenaline really running. And so at that moment, that was the first time I kind of paused for a second, looked out <laughs> and my eyes <laughs> lit up and 
I thought that was the most exciting moment uh, to be able to say a few words to 10,000 yeah. folks that were ready to march. Yeah. Um, that was the most exciting. And I had one other experience uh, in St. Louis uh, after visiting Ferguson uh, uh, in January mm -hmm. of 2014 or 2015. And uh, speaking to a crowd that we marched mm -hmm. in memory of Michael Brown and I, I remember just speaking and just looking towards the sky. Um, and I didn't have a microphone. Mm -hmm. I just used my voice. And uh, that, that weird feeling of just being moved by something else, mm -hmm. you know, something that's mm -hmm. more, a little more bigger than you at that moment. And those are the kind of two kind of, I would say out of body experiences I've had, kind of looking at the enormity of, the, of, the, of those moments. Um, but I, I definitely enjoy, enjoy just being able to talk to folks. I, I love the mm -hmm. conversation. I love the art of the conversation. Uh, and I think we've lost that a bit because of the, the kind of celebrity culture that we have, the kind of <laughs> snap, Snapchat and mm -hmm. soundbite culture that we have, the, the art of the one-on-one, mm -hmm. -on -one, right? Or the group conversation. And so uh, to speak, or to even this conversation, yeah, you yeah. know. Well, there's ways that you I can use it. media to have a conversation still, but I get what you're saying. I totally, I totally understand that the, true, the true. human <laughs> um, connection, that's, um, and that's kind of where we were looking at, trying to bring that human connection online, right? So having a conversation where it's side by side, it's not like I'm just talking directly to you and we can't communicate, you know, together. Um, in that right. space, but then also utilizing um, platforms right. where we can speak to people when we're not there, right? We can speak to their hearts, speak to their souls by having this video platform right. Right. when we're not available all of the time, 24 hours a day, but we still have the ability to touch someone while we're sleeping, right? right? <laughs> and then your voice lives on, your voice lives on, you know, and That's continues right. on. Right. Right. Um, which is ultimately the importance of all sure. of this that we impact sure. our future generations, right? So, um, so yeah. So, with that being said, uh, we know Absolutely. you're not too much of a media guy. You've talked about how you like the pen and the paper, <laughs> but we also know that you are very relevant. Um, <laughs> that you stay relevant. So, please share with us if there's any other last thoughts that you have. But then also share with us how we can connect with you, other than of course going to GreatBlackSpeakers.com to book you. Um, <laughs> Tell us where else we can find you on social media platforms, all that good stuff. Your website. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, you can find me on, of course, Great Black Speakers. Um, you can find me Wonderful. on Instagram, uh, Facebook, nice. uh, Twitter as well. Uh, this has allowed me uh, to become yeah. uh, 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 to stop my lead light. Yeah. My lead light uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. thoughts and ideas. Yeah. <laughs> and enter the 21st century. Um, but you could find me in, in all those those four avenues. Um, my also uh, algier123 at gmail.com. I also allow people to email me uh, any thoughts and comments uh, about my, my work. Uh, you can find me in a group called Socialist Alternative as well. Uh, that's a group I work on a regular basis and, and a member of. Uh, and I'm very, as you know, I'm very active on Facebook from mm -hmm. sharing articles to even sharing some of my work and speeches on YouTube. Find me on YouTube also okay. if you type in Algier or Algier Hawkins. Mm -hmm. um, and you can find some of my most recent talks and speeches. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, some stuff have been uploaded already uh, under Algier and Northeastern uh, from last night's meeting uh, that we had. Uh, so I just, I just thank you for the opportunity. Uh, to speak to you, uh, and of course to to uh, talk about the one of the great passions of my life, and, and that is organizing, speaking, writing, uh, and just having the conversations. Uh, if it's in person or now, the digital web, right? <laughs> the, the, the web media, <laughs> digital web. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, as I'm entering the 21st century, finally. No problem. No problem. So, so I, thank I you. just want to say, Algier, I think I smell a book coming on. Do I smell a book? I think I do. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the dream. That's the dream. That's 
Yes, yes that's definitely. Well, it's definitely it needed and necessary, and I see it in there already. I see the aura of a book around you. <laughs> All right, so thank you so much for joining us here today. And as we said, right, we said that you can go to greatblackspeakers.com to book Algier uh, for your event, but please do go to greatblackspeakers.com and sign up for our newsletter there. You can also take a look at the blogs of some of our amazing uh, great black speakers there as well. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for more greatness. So as I always say, let's get out there and make history. Thank you so much for watching.